I think that's where loose parts in an educational setting are so powerful because the children have to do the work. One thing we talk about with the pod all the time is the more work the toy does, and an iPad is the ultimate example of this, it does all the work, right? The less that the child is doing. And the, as parents and as educators, what we're trying to do is get the children to do the work, right? They to get, if we want to build those complex neural synapse connections in their brains between one thing, social skills, for example, and another thing, telling the time or whatever, we want as many connections across and in the brain to happen before those pairing events happen where the brain goes, oh, I didn't need that. I didn't use it. So just get rid of it, right? Because the, the brain builds itself. And then pairs itself down to what it needs. And then it builds itself again in teenage years and pairs it down. And if you're not using it, the brain just goes, cut it off. Hello and welcome to Blooming Curious, a podcast that's all about nurturing that natural curiosity in our early years, kids and students. I'm Edwina, your host from the Ed's Lessons blog a passionate advocate for play and inquiry, and on a mission to keep children curious and questioning. The days of talk and chalk are over. We're diving into the world of integrated, inquiry and nature-based learning and exploring the strategies that create lifelong learners. So if you're a classroom or homeschool educator or even a curious parent, then this is the place for you. A couple of months ago, I saw a video on social of a new toy called a noodle pod, which essentially replaces all those pesky plastic toys with one beautifully designed, creative, open-ended toy. So I thought if my kids were still young, I would be ordering that thing. And I've been seeing more and more videos on social about this brand new, amazing innovation. And I thought I need to find out more about this thing. And so I did a bit of Googling and found out more about the designer and founder of this amazing innovation. And so today on Blooming Curious, we have Marcus Vierman. Marcus is a playground designer, founder and CEO of a charity called Playground Ideas. Playground Ideas was born when Marcus started designing playgrounds with totally, sorry, with locally available materials, tools and people back in Thailand in 2007. The company's playgrounds have positively impacted the lives of millions of children around the world who have enjoyed the benefits and sheer joy of play. So today, Marcus is here to talk about his playgrounds and his new baby, the Noodle Cart. So welcome to Blooming Curious, Marcus Veerman. Thanks for having me on the show. It's really exciting to have you here. Marcus, I know you've been on social and you're doing the rounds, but can you tell listeners about yourself and how you came to be designing those playgrounds in Thailand those years ago. Firstly, it started the, in 2006. I married a very strong woman. And um, one of the, one of the, <laughs> she wasn't particularly keen on getting married and, <laughs> and set down some very strict requirements. And one of them was that, um, uh, that she wanted to make sure that we were going to go and live overseas and do some development work um, at some stage, and I had to be okay with that. And so we got married in 2006, and by 2007, um, she got a job with something called Australian Volunteers International, which is a volunteer program which places Australian professionals into organisations to help them to develop their organisations and programs overseas. So that started in the... Um, far north of Thailand in a tiny little village called um, Changdao. We lived in a little um, thatch kind of beautiful house with a little in the rice paddy just out the window and a stunning Changdao mountain um, that we'd see the sun rising over every morning. Uh, And then we shifted after about six months to the Thai Myanmar border, so way over to the west side of the country. And I went over there having absolutely no idea what I was going to do. I had worked as an, uh, a mountain guide and outdoor education teacher, both in Australia, and I'd been lucky enough to travel to some amazing places with children. I, I got to go to some very remote locations in Madagascar, Cambodia, and Thailand, and other places. And I, I had happened to, just by chance, build a couple of playgrounds on those trips, um, and 
from the oh, and, and Vietnam. So I built two playgrounds, one in Th- one in Cambodia and one in Vietnam, basically. Mm-hmm. And so when I was arrived in Thailand, and my wife's organization said, "Hey, could you help us build a playground?" I was like, "Sure." So we built a small playground, and before I'd even finished, um, a local school principal who lived way up in the mountains was passing by the property where we were staying. Um. Uh, where I was building the playground and said, I work in this very remote region with the Pandang people who were a, a Nepalese group that had traveled into Thailand thousands of years ago and, and had this small little group that lived up in the mountains, supported by the Thai government, but they didn't have a lot of resources. You know, and she said, could you come up and help us to build a playground? And I said, okay. So I did that. And basically one thing led to another that we, th- th- as soon as I moved to the Thai Myanmar border, I started talking to some of the NGOs that my partner was connected to, and I had another playground build request. In fact, a a guy who was running a big charity, World Education Consortium, said, you know what, my my, my mother just gave me $500 to donate to a project. We've got this great school. I'd like to give it to you. Could you just build a little playground and let's see what happens? His name was Greg, amazing guy, and we built a playground with almost nothing out of recycled materials and car tires and bits and pieces. And from that, that birthed a whole bunch of little partnerships with organizations where over the next two years, we built 40 playgrounds for about 25,000 children. You know, they, they weren't schools. They were operating out of shop fronts and, um, you know, underneath in the basement of houses and places like that. And because we weren't really an organization, we were just a bunch of ragtag volunteers, we could just go in and build playgrounds for these places for very low cost and sort of get the job done and, and create really great spaces for those for those children. Because I've always had, as being a creative person, I've always just had a very strong sense that children will learn what they need to learn um, or at least the majority of children will learn what they need to learn through that self-motivated, intrinsic play drive. We, we've, we've diminished the importance of play by calling it play, which is to do now to do with toys and all sorts of other things. But the, the play drive is essentially the child's drive to learn how the world works and to practice and apply that in their lives so they become competent um, and become increasingly competent throughout their life. Right. Love that. The drive <clears throat> to learn how the world works. That's play. I mean, what else is, what, why else would children spend every waking hour doing this crazy activity, spending all of their energy? You know, you think about it from an evolutionary perspective, scarcity has been a problem for humans throughout time, probably for the majority of time in terms of having enough calories to eat. And yet children are born and all they do is move. They burn everything. It's a death sentence, really, evolutionary speaking. But because we have big heads and our main tool is our brain, not our claws or our, you know, um, teeth, our fangs. No, really, it, it, that's our tool, right? Oh, it's just, and, I'm just and, thinking, you're thinking, what a shame that not enough people are using that tool. <laughs> well, I, I, but I think even, I mean, <laughs> The thing is that humans are. And I'm talking about adults, not children. I know, I know way. exactly what you're saying. <laughs> humans are generalists. We have the ability to use tools to, you know, to do everything that we've done in the world that we see, which is what makes us absolutely incredible and able to adapt to any environment, anywhere, and to solve problems, to be creative and go, okay, I'm struggling with this. How would I solve that problem? Well, uh, can I make a tool? Can I talk to someone? Can I go to a therapist? Can I, you know, like, you think about the, the incredible ways that humans have sold everything to essentially be the dominant species across the entire planet is absolutely, you know, we eclipse everything that's ever come before us in terms of any kind of species. It's quite amazing. And I think that that's all developmentally rooted in play. And no surprise, the closest um, species to us that plays are orangutans, and they, they have a childhood that lasts about um, 8 to 11 years or something like that before maturity, and ours is almost double that length, you know. And, and as society increases in complexity with technologies and other things, have you noticed how childhood is increasing in length? You know, kids stay at home for longer. 
We, do you know what I mean? It's, it's quite interesting oh, how you, you see mean, that. I've got a 22 and a 24 year old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I don't think that's a surprise. I, I, I'm probably also not looking forward to that. But I know, I know. Having it's, kids at home. it's amazing. Mm. I love it. We love having our kids here. They're studying and it's amazing to share in a different way in their lives. It's, mm. and, I, and sometimes we think, how lucky are we to still be able to share in our children's lives? We see it as a blessing. We honestly do. Of course, it's not going to last forever, you know. Yeah, yeah and that, that's a good reality check. You know, and, and humans have probably have lived in fam- small family groups like that, you know, until they partner up with someone else. Course, they would live in that, in, that, in that group. And we, we've sort of, I guess we had to move away from that, you know, um, sort of maybe in the 70s or 80s, which is because of house prices and other things. I think people are staying together for longer and things like that as humans feel better. But, Anyway, so to cut a long story short, you asked me how I got to here. Yeah. So from Thailand and building those 40 playgrounds, we spent the next few years, I got some funding and we spent the next few years essentially documenting everything we learned from that process into simple step-by-step kind of IKEA style, um, step-by-step pictorial directions. We created a five-step playground sort of community consultation playground building manual based on our process and a bunch of, and, and sort of how to assess your playground to the international safety standards, the sort of the basics, if you don't have safety standards in your country and so on and so on and so on. So essentially anyone anywhere can come to our website. They can even set up a crowdfunding page with a PayPal button to raise money. They can get our manuals and educate themselves on how to build a playground. And then they can um, use our online or offline printable drag and drop playground designer and then download those designs and then off they go and so that supports now so up we did 20 playgrounds a year in thailand and that now supports give or take around 700 to a thousand playgrounds around the world every year in about 143 countries so it's a truly scaled up and it costs us about 30 cents for that model and you know, I just want, if anyone's listening out there that runs a charity, I would highly encourage you to give away your IP and allow other people to use what you know for the good of their communities. You know, so many charities take their IP and bundle it up and say, this is our special thing. Our real strength, I think, has been sharing that with the world and allowing, you know, an individual literally anywhere can just stand up and decide they want to make a change and we empower them to do that. That's how our model works. Marcus, that is honestly, that is incredible. So you did say, and it was a thought going through my mind when you were talking there, that it's actually worldwide. So anyone, anywhere, because obviously it's online, it's on the web, so everybody has access to it. And so are you finding that most people or schools or organizations that are going to your website and downloading these playground plans, are they mostly from disadvantaged communities, third world countries, or is it is it a mixed bag or what are you finding? I, I think that it, there's a lot of people who are going on a playground journey for their, you know, their primary school in Perth, for example, oh, yeah. you know, and they, they just get some interesting information. But I would say that most of the people who follow through and actually build are from low-income nations, uh, the global south, things like that, mm-hmm. because you know, we're very constrained here in Australia with safety standards, material use, and community expectations. People people say, well, I know what a playground looks like. Unfortunately, it looks like a bunch of steel poles with a bunch of plastic or steel platforms and roofs and a little, you know, um, simple shop underneath the cubby house. It's not hand-painted. You know, it's has a very refined uh, sort of aesthetic and that that model was set up in the 60s, that sort of modular playground. It's a great business model, but I think that playgrounds can be a lot more and we don't have to do that cookie cutter model. You know, one thing, one thing we love to do in our playgrounds is just heap up earth and grow grass on top of it and put a few little paths up and down it. You know, you don't have to build a slide to give children that falling, slipping, experience. you know, experience. They can just run down a hill. They can roll down a hill, you know, and you know what I mean? We, we, oh, we, get, we get stuck into these sort of swing slide. A playground needs to have a swing slide and a seesaw, but it doesn't. You know, children want 
diversity of experience and they want a stimulating environment, but we don't have to do these same kind of repeated kind of activities all the way through where, uh, you, you know, you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's just silly that we've got this such a fixed standard model. And, and interestingly, I've met the father of that playground design, that poles and platform playground design is sort of credited to one particular person. He's a super creative guy. He didn't, he didn't design those things to be used universally for every playground in the world. He just created a really smart system of connecting poles and platforms together and did all sorts of creative things. I'm, I'm hoping that we have a, a big revolution in this area and see much more creative design. And there are, there are companies um, that are definitely doing more creative things, but they're still in the minority. Because I think what we are seeing, and I, I've, you know, I've spoken about this with another guest who, who's also really into play and outdoor play. I think we're seeing a shift. I see a shift anyway in my local area and in our playgrounds more towards natural materials. Mm. You know, you see more sort of wooden things and uh, nets and these kinds of things. But to me, they're really aesthetically very pleasing but they're so safe. And I think we still lack an element of risk in so many of the playgrounds that are being designed. And when mm. I looked at some of your videos from the playgrounds that you did, must have been in Thailand or Cambodia or somewhere, kids were having so much fun and they were taking risks, but they weren't risks that were going to kill them. They were just risks that could push their bodies to a little bit of a limit because I think we're so wrapping kids up in so much bubble wrap now that they don't actually know how to even take risks anymore. They're so scared just to put one foot in front of the other. Uh, and I think COVID really um, put a huge hole in that. Yeah. I, I think that this sort of, uh, you know, I've been talking about this a bit more lately, this sort of indoor generation. There's a whole bunch of different factors that are going on in the world right Mm. And they're all pushing um, parents and teachers into a really difficult position. But let's come back to that in a sec. I, I want to touch on that word risk that you brought up. If, if there's one message that your listeners could take away from what I'm saying today about risk is that there's actually two words. There's risk and there's hazards. So a hazard is something that deserves a big you know, a uh, fluorescent orange sign next to it that says, if you do this, you're likely to get hurt. So no playground should have a loose screw or nail where a child can stand up and bang their head on, onto it, you know, something like that, or mm. something where they can get splinters or, you know, that, something that's going to cause them an injury. All of those things should be removed from playgrounds for sure. They're called hazards, and that's important to note. Risks, on the other hand, and uh, sorry, the other thing about um, hazards, something that makes something a hazard, there's a really clear defining thing that we sort of worked out in the early days, is something that a child is unlikely to be able to see before they engage in the activity. Mm. That makes sense? So, yeah. for instance, here's, here's an example of something risky. We often make standing seesaws, right? So a big plank that's lower to the ground than a normal seesaw very long, but it's clear that if you walk up that seesaw, when you get to the fulcrum, you know yeah. that it's going to drop down the other side. That's not a hazard. It's a clearly visible, and the longer the seesaw and the more heavy it is, the slower that that, that tilt happens. So your body gets a bit of warning, and obviously you don't have any hazards either side, so you can just jump off if you get a fright, right? So we're learning about physics as well. Yeah, so, so that's that's what I would call a risky a risky activity. It it has a, it gives you a sense in your body, a sensation in your body that you need to respond to. Um, and if you are a very young child, that could be a very challenging physical element. And then as you get older, the great thing about that same element is instead of tiptoeing up, you can run up and see how far you can get off before you jump off the end because you expect that that fulcrum shift. And then you can, you know, you know, and you can increase the level of challenge. So, but I think it's very important to note the difference in my mind. I don't talk about there's, there's not risks that are dangerous and risks that are positive. I just say 
There are certain things that are hazards. We need to get rid of those. But taking risks is absolutely foundational to growth. And that's true, you know, with, with the launch of Noodle, if we hadn't, if we didn't take risks and, uh, you know, and make enough products, we get to a point very quickly where we run out of product and we run out of money and the whole charity goes downhill. And you know what I mean? Like yeah. you have, you have to take risks in life and the removal of risks is a critical error that takes away the men, fun. many, many parents are making that error on a daily basis where they stop their child. I can, this is something that drives me crazy. You go yeah. to the playground. Or you go to, you know, even just a, a birthday party or something, and you see parents removing the the responsibility from the child to take a risk, whether it's a social risk, you know, you sort of, you know, micromanaging a child's emotional response. Yeah. To yeah, no, I mean, I think we got we got to be careful with those terms because it makes parents sometimes feel guilty. I think it's more just kind of going. Let's talk about the positives of allowing your child to take that risk with that child who's just snatched their toy. They've come back to you and they're really upset. Yeah, sure, you can comfort them, but then you don't have to go and manage that situation. Give them some advice, give them some scaffolding, and then send them out into the battlefield of life, right? That's their job to work that out. They've got to, they've got to, they've got to practice these skills over and over and over and over again and work out what works for them. You know, if they snatch that toy back, you can coach them again. What happened there? Instead of saying, don't do that, you can't do that, it's never going to work. Mm. You, can, you can say, what happened there? Was that effective? Did you get what you wanted? Did the world get what it needed from that situation? Or maybe there's, you know, are there other options? You know, and I know that can be exhausting, but okay. no, actually, I think parents are doing exhausting things all the time. In fact, probably taking too much of the responsibility. And they need to sort of, I think oftentimes there are a lot of parents who need to really, really step back. I think it, it's hard because often you've got, you know, when you've got two parents, often you find that, you also find that conflict between the parents where one is standing back probably a little too much and not engaging. I don't know if you've seen that movie, The Incredibles, mm -hmm. where, you know, the father is, you know, he's, he's really distracted and his wife screams at him, would you engage? Just engage. <laughs> And, and, you know, if he's off with the fairies, then, and, and, uh, and I think that you often get that combination of one parent who's just off with the fairies and the other parent is feeling like they're grinding through and carrying all this stuff and trying to find a way to sort of find a nice place between them where you can allow children to take risks and to do those things, you know. Going back to what you've just said, I think sometimes as parents and even as teachers, we jump in too soon. Sometimes I think. It's helpful to just stand back, just watch, just listen, and let the kids sort things out. Let them try first before you jump in to scaffold and help. Because I think they're very good at sorting themselves out. You know, I think we sometimes interfere too quickly. And that's the other thing is that play or really deep independent play, kids just want to be left alone to get on with what they're doing. And I think Play is really important for that it's just because you learn so much from play. You're actually learning so much from, you know, if I'm going to snatch this toy away from this child, every time I do that, there's a consequence that happens, you know, and I think that they learn that. But of course, as adults, when we're standing back a little bit and observing, we can come in and scaffold and as you've said so wisely, you know, say to them, has that been helpful? You know, has it yeah. helped your cause? So I think what you've said there is really wise, and I hope a lot of people take note of that. Marcus, you mentioned the noodle cart. So that's your latest venture. And I've also seen you've also have some other noodle products. So can you explain what the noodle cart is and how you see the noodle cart and your idle noodle things being used by children? Yeah, sure. Just one thing you got me. Can I go back just to one point? Yeah, that I thought, cause it's such a, this is such a fascinating topic that we've been talking about for, I mean, over a decade. I just wanted to cover that point about how do we get to this place where there's less risk and, and those kind of things? Like what, what is actually, you know, a lot of people ask, ask me and we've we'll, we'll been talking about like, why, how did we get here? Right. With this sort of helicopter parenting and, and the, the lack of risk and other things in it. I, I think there's lots and lots yeah. of reasons, but I think there's some unusual 
macro factors that we don't often think about that I just wanted to quickly touch on. Mm. And one of them is family size. A lot of people don't think about this, right? The pressure on parents to do all of this coaching work and to be close and talking with their child, I think is to do, uh, is there's a major factor that no one's really talking about, which is essentially the number of children per family. When you have, as you did mid last century, 4.5 children per household versus now when you've got about 1.6. And in Japan, I mean, it's, it's, a chronic problem, right? You've got two parents and one child on average. If you take, so here's just one example of how that affects everything. If you take a standard suburban, ur- like urban block, what we used to have was l- marauding groups of 20 to 30 kids after school and lower numbers of cars in suburbs, smaller streets, more dirt roads and things like that where people would drive and cars that were more cumbersome with worse brakes so they would drive slowly. And cars also had an expectation that they would run into giant groups of children playing cricket, football or whatever on the street. So people treated the street as a shared space. When you reduce the numbers from you know, if you think about a standard block might have 20 houses and four and a half ch- children in each house, that's, that can be 30, 40 children who might be in multiple groups around those streets doing things on the street. They are learning intensely all of these social skills that you're talking about. Without parents, the, in the rough and tumble of that world, older children are going, we can't play cricket unless we put our arm behind our back because the little kids won't play with us because we keep winning. Right, That compassion and empathy is being learned through those kinds of skills. And the younger children get to stand further away from the goals or they get to have three kids against one bigger kid. You know, we, we don't see that as much, this multi-age challenging play where the older children have to disadvantage themselves to play with the younger children. Peter Gray is an amazing guy who talks a lot about this kind of stuff that I find absolutely fascinating. But the other thing that's happened is when you've got less siblings, the parent becomes the friend or the sibling, right? There's a change in that relationship because the child has to play. They are hardwired not to play on their own, but to play with another person or other people. And so the formalizing of culture, the lowering number of children means that now we've got play dates instead of just kids walking into their next door neighbor's house. And stranger danger is absolutely terrifying parents. So, you know, allowing your child to roam and just go to another person's house and things like that is incredibly stressful and difficult for parents. And I'm not saying they just should let them go, but it is all of these factors are kind of compounding to create a situation where, and this leads into Noodle Cart and the work that I'm doing with the pod, where parents need an environment in the home because we can can't solve a lot of these problems. You can't just go, oh, well, I'll just let the kids roam around the streets. Now they're full of cars. Now that there's less kids on the street, you know, these are hard problems. So the pod is trying to create an environment to solve some of these problem solving creativity challenges and make a great environment for lower numbers of children and their parents to connect together and do these enjoyable activities together. Instead of the parents sitting there with these toys that beep and make all these annoying noises and, and don't, and they, and they're so boring for the parent. We're trying to create an environment that works with parents and children in this modern environment to give them that risky, open-ended, creative space that's enjoyable for both parent and child because we just, we appreciate that there's parents doing that work now. I have to say, I have never considered family size as an impact on play. So this is incredibly enlightening. Yeah, and and, and it makes total sense, actually. I have to say, um, my kids' formative years when they were little were spent in the Middle East. And I guess as an expat, we lived in these little small gated communities. Mm. And my own kids now say how lucky they were to spend that time there. Because these kids would roam around that little community. They would Mm. be in these bands on the streets, you know, setting up ramps and skateboarding over them and running amok outside. So luckily for my children, they actually did have that experience, but we were only lucky because we were in the small gated community where cars knew the minute they entered, 
there'd be kids on the streets, as you've just said. And so there was a slowing down because they expected yeah. to see children running around. And those so. community expectations are so important because they change our behavior and, the, and you know, what we expect to occur is more likely to occur. Whereas now, I mean, for your listeners, if you think about a little no, child no, who walks to the front out. gate, no. they walk to the front gate, they look left, they look right, there's no one there. If mum and dad are busy or a sibling is busy, then they go and play on their Nintendo Switch, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? They, the opportunity is not taken up. They go, oh, I'd like to do blah, blah, blah. The, own, the only thing, that, so just to add to your story, the thing that's working for my children and my family at the moment and again, I feel incredibly blessed to have this. I live in an apartment where I'm sitting right now, where on this side of the apartment at the front door, there's a small street, very quiet. It's a dead end street. But just out there, I don't know if you can see. Mm, it's a park. There's a park on the south side. And out that way is a park. And we specifically chose this place because of that. Is a park on the um, west side. But what's amazing about the west side is we have a door out there and crucially no street and so when my very flighty fast moving energetic children run out the back door i don't have an anxiety attack because they run out they hear the kids playing in the park and they can just go and i don't have to stop them right i've got a child who would run out on a road in straight in front of a car you know even probably now at 10 years old and it's the you know that causes um us no end of stress but living in an environment with it, where that just that one thing, the street has changed, and that the whole apartment block, um, you know, we're quite squeezed in here, but we don't want to move because there's 15 apartments all opening out to the park, and many of them have children, and so it just means that large group interaction is where all of those social skills and other things are practiced is happening really well. It's beautiful, you know. You see the sun sets on the west side, and you see these kids in groups of five or eight, you know, and they're is squabbling about this and they're laughing about that and they're playing this game and now it's this and you know collecting po huge piles of grass to build you know some giant snowman or whatever you know all of that stuff happens on a daily basis here yeah? and I, I never take it for granted because most people nowadays i think they're saying that you know by 2050 70 percent of the entire human population will live in cities so this low birth rate moving to cities is a fundamental change that we're not going to get rid of and we need our toys and our school resources and other things to do more in less space and in this new world that we're living in. So Marcus, now before we talk about the, the cart, I think you've also touched on something else there, town planning. And so really people who are planning, you know, towns and these new high rises and buildings They've got to be smarter, right? Like I'm Absolutely. getting seriously annoyed when I drive just around here in Perth and I'm seeing nursery schools pop up and they're wall to wall with no outdoor space for these kids to play. And gosh, that's like sending a kid mm. in a prison every day while you're at mm. work. There's no grass, there are no trees, there's no outdoor. These kids are confined to concrete. And it yep. makes me incredibly angry and incredibly sad. And I think town planning have to take the blame for that because why would you allow a preschool to be in that location or to be built in that manner where there's now no access to nature for children? Mm. I think that's crucial and, and we need to be influencing, I don't know how, but we've got to do something about getting town planners to take the next generation, because as you say, there's going to be more people, we're going to be in high rises and in apartments, they have to get smarter about how do we make it safe and healthy for children. Yeah, and, and, and things that, that, are, things that are planned well have a higher value, right? So in, in Melbourne, where I live, you know, there are some really great examples in a suburb called Doncaster, which is just an outer suburban town. They have these houses that are built on these very curvy roads and, and coming off the curvy roads are these very short, you can't drive through them. Mm. You just go into these little pockets off the main street and all the houses are off these pockets. And as a result, you've got low traffic counts and kids can play cricket and stuff in the end of the cul-de-sac. So that's one 
We, we are seeing those things in it. I've seen where they created smaller streets and at the back door of the houses was a long kind of linear winding path that connected all of the houses at their back gate. So slightly smaller backyard. But then when you go through the back gate, there's this long connected park. I didn't love that so much because it was sort of behind the, a tall back fence. So line of sight was difficult. I think line of sight for parents is something that we always took into account for playground design. Where do parents sit and and what can they see? Because as soon as they feel like they can't sort of see particularly young children, mm. they're going to stop the play. They're going to bring them back. So th- there's these little things you really need to think about with adults. The other thing that I saw in Germany um, years and years ago, which was absolutely incredible, was basically all of the streets in this particular housing estate were kind of like laneways single direction um, laneways with garages on each side, nothing to look at, just these garages. And you would drive your car in these kind of almost like service lanes. And then they took the linear park idea and they put it in the front. So small Mm -hmm. front yards, almost like a patio and a little tiny garden space. And then they shared the rest of that space. And then every five or 10 houses, there was a little gap and there was different play spaces in every gap so in one of them was just a massive boulder just a huge rock that you could climb on that you could hide around the back of and things like that in another one there was a more of standard playground another one just had a giant long seesaw very low cost interventions and then just grassy space so you could have a picnic or whatever but it it reduced that private space but gave access to the community to many many big public or you know large-ish public spaces where you were shaving off a little bit of private space for everyone and then giving access to a much larger public space and there, there are tons of examples of great town planning and human beings as soon as they see that they love it you know it, it always staggers me like new housing developments almost always on the poster they don't put a picture of the house alone no. they put a picture of the playground and the park that's what people want you know, that's the big sales ticket. Does this place have a have a longer line of sight to a green space where I can share and have good times with the people around me and connect me to my community? That's, you know, they never have a picture of a supermarket on the poster. Nobody cares. Uh, you know, sure, you've got to go to the supermarket, but that's not the, what people really value. It's that connection and community within a space for them and their children. That's so true. And let's hope that town planning takes you know, more of that into consideration as they allow new buildings to pop up everywhere. And Marcus, you touched on the noodle cart and you mentioned that one of the things was that it was an innovative toy, let's call it that, where in a small family, parents could get more involved and interactive with their children. So was that your original idea for it or with you working with all these children and schools, did that have some kind of influence on you when you were constructing your prototype for the noodle cart? So what was it that that got this whole idea rolling for you? A few things came together all at once. First of all, we worked with a government entity. I won't say who it was. Playground Ideas was going really well. And we won a contract to build 300 playgrounds across one of the newest nations called Timor-Leste, which is up. It had separated from Indonesia, and there was a lot of develop, big development work going on there, multi-million dollar project. And we tried to use the playground idea model, you know, local and recycled materials to build those playgrounds for early childhood centers. Very, very low cost. We had a very small budget. And East Timor is mountainous, um, lots of valleys, beaches, agricultural areas, cities, very diverse places we're building in. And we're building in communities where one valley and one community would barely talk to people in the other valley. They didn't share materials. They, you know, they were quite disconnected. And the playground ideas model just didn't really work very well. We, you know, there weren't even enough recycled car tires in the entire country that we could find to build those 300 playgrounds. And so the challenge of that project to make that work really spurred us on to kind of go, how could we create not just, you know, play spaces that were as good as 
the fixed playgrounds that we had planned to build in Timor Leste, but actually better. I sort of went on to this sort of fanatical kind of classic me sort of exploration of what could that look like. And at the same time as that, an, inc- an absolutely incredible woman, one of the most creative and amazing designers I've ever met called Emma Ribbons, um, just sent me a message through Playground Ideas and said, I've been doing these loose parts activations in Greek refugee camps for Syrian refugees. You remember when S- Syrian refugees were crossing the Mediterranean yeah. and you know there was that famous picture of that child that had died on the beach that went around the world, that awful, you know, with just thousands of people in peril coming across into Greece. She was literally taking a, a backpack made out of kind of cardboard boxes almost with straps on it, this big bulky box full of loose parts and taking into refugee camps because they couldn't build physical structures in the space. They weren't allowed to. The refugee camp was like, look, this is not going to be here forever. You can't build a playground. So she took in loose parts. We immediately clicked and we started exploring this idea of what if you created a no compromises, mobile, on wheels space that you could just open up and would completely transform any space into a really highly stimulating space that taught all of these incredible skills that we saw children learning with loose parts. It just so happened that I had put a loose, a giant loose parts box in one of the Timorese playground designs when Emma compa- contacted me. So it was something I was really interested in. We also have a loose parts manual that's freely downloadable from the um, playground ideas website if anyone's interested in loose parts and sort of okay. the theory behind it and the material that experience with emma became the initial trials that we did with syrian refugees in lebanon where i sent emma and a few of my staff over to build the very first cast and to trial it in i mean the, the very first trial we did in a refugee community extremely impoverished area in lebanon where it, it was just old ramshackle, old apartment blocks that these people were living in, very low rent, very low services. They had no playgrounds, they had nothing. And we actually trialed the first one on tarpaulins in a lane that smelled like urine. We worked with a fantastic um, organization called Right to Play who found us the only open spaces, community spaces we could find were laneways and other things. We blocked them off and we put the loose parts out and it, it was absolutely incredible. That, just purely by chance, um, a guy called Roger Ungers, who I'd sent over there to just document the process, take some photos and video and help us, he turned that into a film. It's called The Wheels of Wonder, and it's available from the Noodle Cart uh, website. You can just buy a ticket from there, and I strongly suggest you do it. It's an amazing exploration of that, of that initial experience we had. That was a very costly experience to build the first one, and we were running out of money. Um, and so I decided then, the, big, the next big shift was I decided then to say, well, look, we can't go to refugee camps anymore. I wonder whether we could be cheeky enough to send out an email and see if there were teachers in Australia who would be willing to bring this crazy thing into Australian schools. So by that time, we had done some safety testing on it and we knew that it was uh, you know, safe and, and could be used with kids. So... We, we got 12 schools to immediately sign up within 24 hours saying, yeah, bring it on. We'd love to see it. And eight of those schools, completely unexpected by me, said, we'd love to buy one of these. And I was like, well, they're not for sale. You know, this is our nonprofit charitable, you know, playground thing. And the teacher said, but look at the skills they're learning. They're learning. So in the Australian curriculum for US listeners, we've since found out through a Bond University study, they are learning all of the subpoints of the critical and creative thinking capability in the Australian curriculum and all of the 28 subpoints in the curriculum, all of them were demonstrated also in the personal and social skills capabilities. Now, we have not tested the CART for numeracy, literacy, and the other curriculum areas, but in those two areas alone, with no, this is really important, with no teacher direction, so you can have your worst teacher, you know, your tired, depressed, burnt out teacher sitting in the corner on a banana lounge with a pina colada doing nothing and they will learn 
and demonstrate and practice all of the 28 subpoints of those curriculum areas with you doing nothing. No setting challenges, nothing, just in open-ended play. So that was another light bulb moment where I went, again, this play drive, which we really diminished in terms of just something frivolous that children do, is now Bond University has shown that all of those points were covered with teachers doing nothing, right? Let alone the other curriculum areas. And that's where we kind of went, well, maybe we could turn this into a social enterprise that actually raised funds and supported the charity, right? So we should probably go back a step. The Noodle Cast, just so people can imagine if they're listening to this in audio, is about three feet long and two feet wide for your American listeners or 1.2 meters long and about 65 centimeters wide. And it sits at about hip height. So it just goes to a, it just fits to a standard doorway and it's about the long arm long. What's interesting about it is it has this, we have this no waste kind of theory where every part of the storage device, so the cart on wheels, It looks like kind of a Danish piece of furniture. When you pull all the parts and you deconstruct that cart, there's nothing left. There is no storage device anymore. This storage device is all of the playable parts. So when we make a noodle cart, just as an aside, there's nothing left but sawdust and a little tiny plywood frame. One noodle cart is made out of exactly four sheets of plywood. And so those 350 parts are usable by an entire classroom of children to engage in completely open-ended, high-quality, high-stimulation kind of slow-state exploration where they can build literally anything. If they want to build a rocket ship, the other day I saw seven children build a rocket ship that they got inside. They're all huddled inside this little, <laughs> this this rocket ship. You know, if you want to teach the time, instead of going, oh, I'll get my clock resource, you know, my plastic kind of clock resource and then here's one for each, you know, groups of two or whatever, forget that. Just look at the clock on the wall and teach the kids how it works and then say, here's a bunch of random parts. You build me a clock. I don't care what it looks like as long as it works. And then you say, can you make that clock show three o'clock? Can you make it say quarter past two? Blah, blah, blah. And then this is where the noodle um, has this, what we call multi-layered learning. So instead of, instead of doing numeracy and doing literacy or doing these separate boxes, which, you know, large organizations love to put things in boxes, the cart has this multi-layered effect where the kids might be working in a group and learning all these social skills like negotiation and design and, and, you know, iteration and collaboration to build their clock at the same time as learning how a clock works. At the same time as working out, how are we going to make these hands spin, you know, one on top of the other so they're banging to each other? I don't know, whatever those questions are, they're doing all of these sort of, I see it like all these transparent layers that that build into a block of learning, which are much, much more complex than just learning about how to tell the time of the clock. And I think that's where loose parts in an educational setting are so powerful because the children have to do the work. One thing we talk about with the pod all the time is the more work the toy does, and an iPad is the ultimate example of this, it does all the work, right? The less that the child is doing. And as parents and as educators, what we're trying to do is get the children to do the work, right? They To get, if we want to build those complex neural synapse connections in their brains between one thing, social skills, for example, and another thing, telling the time or whatever we want as many connections across and in the brain to happen before those pairing events happen where the brain goes oh i didn't need that i didn't use it so just get rid of it right because the brain builds itself and then pairs itself down to what it needs and then it builds itself again in teenage years and pairs it down and if you're not using it the brain just goes cut it off what is it if you don't use it you lose it exactly it's like a muscle and so in an extreme example of that, we know that that's, it sounds crazy, but we know it's true. Those Romanian orphans, they did MRIs of those children's brains and you can see it with the naked eye. You can see the density and complexity, the rutting and the size of the brain in the brain case was physically smaller because of a lack of stimulation. Now, we're not going to see that in Australia. You know, there's plenty of stimulation around. It's much harder to see with the naked eye, but we, but I'm just using that as an example 
to say, if you want to maximize children's development, which is obviously the, the goal, we want children to have the, the best opportunity to thrive throughout life, then these complex open-ended environments, I think, are the closest thing to give us that, that benefit. And, I, and, and, and so the noodle car and the smaller noodle rover, which is for eight to 10 children, I, I think offers the most open-ended. We sort of just went, what if we turn this up to 11? What would that look like? And what came out the other side was the noodle cart and the noodle rover for so education, allied health and those kinds of things. Well, you know, it seems <laughs> to me as an educator myself who works in a school, there are two big words, budget and resources. But it seems to me we should be getting rid of a lot of those superfluous resources and plasticky things and goodness knows what, and just spend our money and get a noodle cart, which can do everything that all those or most of those other resources can do. Because now it's open-ended. And I think, and I'm a very big proponent of loose parts play. Hmm. And I'm always saying to people, it doesn't matter, just get whatever you can, you know, just get it. And because you can do so much with it. When people say to me, oh, we don't have the budget, I'm saying, well, look in your bin and just get some recycled stuff. Take all the plastic tops off bottles, <laughs> go to Bunnings, get some pebbles, get some stones, go for a walk, get sticks, get seed pods, get gum nuts, whatever. Those are all loose parts, freely available, right? But on the other side of the coin, and I think this comes to what I want to ask you about, the materials that we use. Because very often we're saying for loose parts, use whatever you've got. And I think using whatever you've got is better than not using anything. But if you can use something as beautiful and well-designed as your products, why wouldn't you do that? So could you explain the use of materials and your thinking specifically behind the materials that you've chosen, the plywood, for example, and the construction of the components of the cart. What was your thinking behind that? Okay, so there's a, there's a bunch of things that I want to talk about. One is those pods, those loose parts, pods, you know, shipping containers full of stuff. I'd love to talk a little bit about that. Mm-hmm. And then I'd love to also, yeah, let's talk about the parts. So just for that first point, we almost, before the cart, the noodle cart rover pod existed, we almost took over a uh, shipping container loose parts uh, organization that was running in Melbourne. They were struggling and it actually, it, it, it's working, I think, in the UK quite successfully when it's scaled up, but it's a really hard business to run. They had to run a huge truck that would go around to all these factories and pick up all the parts. One, one problem I always, and I'm very, very conscious to say this because I don't want to have any negativity, but you know, one thing I was always concerned about was when you're using industrial materials, which they use a lot of, which are fantastic. Yeah, just you don't know where they've come from. So you need to make sure that they're not, they don't have lead or formaldehyde or other VOCs and other chemicals that have been used either in the manufacture or in the the chemicals used to make sure that the mold doesn't stick into the whatever. So that was always something that was a little bit of a liability concern that I wasn't sure about. And then there were things like, I love cardboard tubes you know those giant cardboard tubes and things from fabrics and whatever um but they need to be carefully managed because as soon as it rains they get wrecked and moldy and then you've got black mold and you know this there were a bunch of real challenges there now the places that i've seen that working really well is when a teacher so coolaroo south primary school incredible principal a few years ago they've left now had a couple of uh, shipping containers full of stuff it was managed by Another incredible play worker called Catherine Sewell, who was there every week, maintaining, gathering parts, sorting them, making sure that everything worked. And they had an absolutely unbelievable program. They didn't spend money on playgrounds. They spent money on creating a great learning environment within the um, playground. So if it's done right, I think it's great. If you end up with just parents bringing whatever crap, to be honest, from home, and putting it in a thing, it's a disaster. And I've had endless parents tell me how they thought it was a great idea. They went all in. And then six months, 12 months later, it, it was a poorly managed uh, eyesore. That was a big problem. You know, Coolaroo South, even with their fantastic program, had a lot of community pl- complaints saying this place looks like a rubbish dump. What's going on? There's car tires. There's, you know, what about mosquitoes forming? You know, all sorts of things like that. So, you know, 
car tires, fantastic, just drill holes in them. But there's all sorts of solutions for those kind of things, but it's not a simple solution. There's more to it than people think. Okay. And that's why we didn't take it over. But managed properly, incredible. And the UK has hundreds of examples and Australia, I'm sure, has lots of great examples as well. I just don't know quite as many. Um, I think that's what you've just touched on there, managed properly. Yes. I think loose parts are wonderful, but if you have them on a playground, yes, it absolutely can look like a disaster. And that's why somebody has to take responsibility for them and be in charge of, or whatever it might be, of looking after loose parts play and make sure that things are organized, as you said before, that there are no hazards and mm. It, it cannot just be, well, I'm just going to throw it needs maintenance. stuff out there yep, and absolutely. see what happens. That isn't how it's meant to be because actually… And student rosters. You, get the students yeah, to help as well. If yeah. you want to do things properly in life, whatever it might be, if you want to do it well, you actually have to do some work because nothing works beautifully just by leaving it out there and hoping yeah. for the best. You actually have to get involved and… Yeah. And it's similar and to, it. I saw a carpenter on YouTube, a video of a carpenter the other day who did an experiment and said, I've seen all these woodworkers making tables out of pallets, like wooden recycled pallets. And he said, I'm going to do an experiment where I build a table out of pallets and then I build a table out of um, poplar, which is the lowest cost hardwood you could use for a, a table. And he did a calculation of the cost. And what was fascinating was the pallet wood actually cost significantly more, not big. Even though the materials were free, the amount of time to prepare everything and maintain everything was significantly higher than the poplar table. Now, if you want the recycled table and if that's what you want for your kids, it's totally possible. But you just, I'm just saying you need to go in with your eyes open that there is no free lunch for any of this stuff. So materials. So first of all, uh, Corpus Christi in Kingsville in Melbourne use our carts as almost like a play pod response. They've created an a cordoned off area with AstroTurf on the ground. Really fantastic principle, lovely person, just really trying to encourage great, great spaces for kids. Cordoned off area, AstroTurf, and the grade sixes manage a roster where they push the cart out, deconstruct it, and a different class gets to use it each lunchtime over, say, two weeks, and then the roster repeats. And the grade sixes manage that. There's a bell that goes, and they start to pack it up and they bring it inside. I don't know if they're still doing that, but they were definitely doing that last time I checked with them. Fantastic, simple program. And then the cart is stored inside, no mess, no fuss, no maintenance. The cart comes with a maintenance pack, just extra screws and other things to keep it going because we see it more like a car that you know you, you look after over time or last you over a decade, but with very, very little work to do that, to remove a lot of these issues that we we saw in other different types of programs. We really worked hard on that. Materials. Unlike a lot of loose parts, construction sets and systems and other things, the pod doesn't use hardly any plastic at all. But more importantly, it's not just one material. So, you know, for instance, I was talking to the lovely guys at Play Silkies who make these silk scarves. It's just, it's, it's fantastic. It's one material and then it gets blended with other loose parts. The cart has inside it hard wooden pieces that are both large and heavy, which, by the way, if you don't have large, heavy parts, you don't get social skills and collaboration. That was clear. That was found very clearly from the Sydney Playground Project. Anita Bundy, a fantastic researcher with oh, Shirley Wyver, W-Y-V-E-R, did some incredible studies in loose parts over a decade. Anita's now in the States, Shirley's still in Australia. Two American researchers, absolutely incredible. They found that heavy, heavy parts in, encourage collaboration. It's a bit like the, you don't think about the, the lowering number of siblings affecting play. Heavy parts, some people avoid them in um, loose parts spaces because they're worried that someone's going to drop them on their toe or whatever. But if you don't have them, kids don't have to work together. If you have a lower number of large, heavy parts, that was one thing that they found as a, as a real key. And one of its sort of six or seven findings of the, of what makes loose part playgrounds work really well. Along with those, and then we have small timber parts. We have wooden dowels that fit perfectly through all of the holes in the plywood, but those wooden dowels also fit through the loops in the 
Tencel webbing straps. Tencel is an incredible, it looks like polyester, that strong sort of rock climbing webbing or backpack strap webbing, but it's made of wood fiber. And then there are silicon pieces, which also stretch over the sticks and stretch onto the wooden pieces. And then the straps fit over the silicon pieces. And so what we've essentially done is instead of having a linear kind of this fits this, and then this fits this, it's almost like a circle where all the materials are in a circle. And the connections are zigzag like a star between everything. So the functionality of each different material does totally different things. So some of them, the straps work really well under tension, but they obviously are floppy under compression. The silicon pieces are stretchy and have kind of inbuilt kind of springiness to them. So you can flick things and move things. The wooden pieces are obviously hard both ways. The The dowels are round, so things will spin around them. So all of these different physics principles are embedded in it. So if you want to build a right angle, you can use a right angle plywood piece. If you want something to rotate around a hinge, you can use a stick with a something over a hole. You know, for instance, like the middle of a clock, if you want to rotate an arm around something. It's messy and it's organic, but if you want to do that thing that's in your mind, whatever it is, you can just use a kind of a hacker mentality, which I absolutely love. People who do well and are innovative and creative, they hack things together. They go, you know what, this will do. And I want to encourage that mindset in children to go, I don't ha- I don't have the perfect product. I don't have the perfect thing to do this thing. But if I want to generally get that direction, I'm going to just iterate and find these pieces and put them together in interesting ways until I find a sufficient solution to demonstrate the thing that I'm thinking about whether it's a rocket ship or a rainbow or a horse or one little story that we had in terms of the cart and schools, a Canberra school ran noodle cart sessions for kids over an entire term every week. And at the start, they did the usual thing where they build cars and trucks and helicopters and whatever. By the 10th session at the end of the term, I saw this incredible write-up of a kind of in the play world, you might call a play frame or in our noodle cart world, just a sort of a a vignette, a narrative story. One child garnered a bunch of kids to come together and build an MRI machine. It was just basically a, a flat board with a bunch of these silicon hoops going over the top. The child got inside that, got scanned. They were very sick. They died. And then the MRI machine, which was this flat board, became a coffin which was then picked up by the children and carried to a funeral and they held an entire funeral for that child. And this entire thing happened within sort of this 10-week program that went from one to another. And some people might go, oh, that's a bit weird and morbid and macabre, whatever. But that child is going through, I can guarantee you that child is going through their own self-initiated therapeutic process to understand what on earth has just happened in my life. Right. And they've garnered five or six other children to have that experience and to the, the essentially using kind, empathic friends to play through that narrative, you know, and, and everything on the other side of the room, you know, there were other kids probably having a fashion show or building an airplane, you know, nothing to do with it. But for that child, that moment, this was an opportunity to explore and process something in their lives that was very important. And again, that comes back to that multi layered learning with loose parts where you're doing hardcore curriculum learning mixed with these psychological and therapeutic layers and the social layers brings together a really complete package of learning processing and all that stuff for children so that's just a little vignette in this school sort of therapeutic context you know as you've been talking as a teacher the one thing that i am a big proponent of is integrating different subject areas into one because people are always talking about how busy and overcrowded the curriculum is. So I'm a really big one. Well, let's see how we can actually kill a couple of birds with one stone. And I actually think while you've been talking that this noodle cart is really the ultimate experience because, as you've said before, there's maths, there's, in, there's social and emotional well-being, there's language, there's cooperation, and storytelling. So I think it actually encompasses the entire curriculum. As an educator, you could actually empty most of your storeroom 
of all that rubbish that's in there and rather spend your money and get one of these things, which can do so much and you can integrate it into different areas and meet curriculum outcomes with one thing. So why wouldn't we do that? It, it, it just makes perfect yeah. sense to me. So, And one, one thing you just said, just to touch on that, that study, so with that um, funeral, that when we were doing that study, that was actually a mathematics study and it wasn't, it, we didn't get the results we got were non-conclusive because the study wasn't written very well. But anecdotally, when, this, when it was finishing up, this math study, the principal came to me and said, look, I don't know about maths and the math skills that have been garnered from this process. We had some troubles with a couple of people running the study, got COVID in the middle and we had a whole, a whole bunch of complexities. But the principal said, whatever happened in that study, what I saw was an unbelievable increase in vocabulary. The kids, the amount of words per minute that the children were speaking and listening and all those, uh, all those language skills is through the roof compared to a normal classroom because the kids for the whole time are running on this sort of in- high engagement um, negotiation and collaboration in that space. And so definitely that, that was just a, a weird, just a very strange thing that we saw that was unexpected was their language skills. Uh, no, really, it's the opposite of an iPad. <laughs> well, yeah, but again, because it's not like when you look at when you look doing. at loose parts, they, they don't do anything. When yeah. you look at loose parts, they're just a bunch of con- highly connectable, very beautifully designed pieces that connect in billions of ways. But if you do no work, they have zero value. They don't look like something. They don't function in any way. They don't beep or flash or say anything. I haven't talked about this for ages. One thing I think that that does in the brain. You know those ink blot tests that um, psychologists Rorschach. use, right? Yeah. So Rorschach you know it's tests. just a bunch yeah. of random paint. Yeah. That's a little bit like I think what loose parts do in the brain. They they give you an itch to scratch because they are so unhelpful. They don't say anything, and so that so similar to an ink blot test, you go when well, your brain goes because you know, humans are pattern makers and meaning finders, tool makers. You know, we, we make connections between things. Our brain is literally just a connection machine. Children see the pieces and they can't, it's like they can't help but put them, make sense out of them. And that sense that they make is through an individual drive in their brain to understand how the world works. Does that make sense? It's a weird psychological thing that I think is happening in a child's brain where they run towards it and they go, you need to make a pattern or make sense. And at the moment, it does nothing. And I've got to make that meaning for it to make sense. Marcus, this is a fascinating talk and one that I think we can talk about for days. But how can teachers, parents, school administrators, principals, how do they get hold of one of these things? And I think in the beginning of our talk, you mentioned something about going on there. or Was that that just for the playground, setting up a PayPal or whatever it was? How do we go about, how can people, teachers listening, principals hopefully listening, how can they get hold of a noodle cart for their school? So there's three things. The noodle cart is for 30 children, for teachers. The noodle rover is for 8 to 10 children. Fantastic meltdown mitigation tool outside the vice principal or assistant principal's office is one of the most common things. And schools often buy one of each for those purposes. And we didn't even talk about the pod. So we've just launched mm. the pod um, over Which 800. Which is what I saw, actually. Yeah, just yeah, my yeah. first introduction was the it's, noodle pod. The, no, I love talking about the, the background philosophy of all this stuff so much we didn't even talk about. It. But the pod is basically a home-based family version of the cart and rover. It, just very briefly, it, it, only, it does two main things. Number one, it reduces the clutter by becoming all of those large and some small scale toys that are completely filling up the square space of your child's bedroom. You know, people are moving into apartments, they have less space than ever before. Their houses are full of stuff that removes the square meterage in the house to do those open-ended adventurous things. The car just becomes all of those toys so you can put all that stuff on marketplace or not buy it in the Food future. Place, yeah. I was just writing an email actually to pod users about this mentality of experiences, not stuff. If it doesn't create great experiences, get rid of it. And then for birthdays, when often this single use plastic toy rubbish comes into your house, just tell people, I want you to buy me experiences, not stuff. I want a present 
which encourages my child a dance class, an art class, you know, some bushwalking boots so we can get outside more, you know, a jumpsuit for the rain so that they can go outside, whatever. Things that enc- encourage experiences and memories, not more stuff. So the, so the pod gets rid of the clutter. And then the second thing it does is it, it creates a, an open-ended environment where the child becomes the toy maker, not the toy user. They don't become a consumer of toys. They become a maker um, and, a, and a tinkerer of, uh, and create their own unique customized toys that work for their unique quirkiness, right? Their individuality. And the pod, other than the making of the toys, does all of that same great stuff that the, the Cart and Rover do, but you know, really small package in the home. Um, and it's really enjoyable to use between parents and children to fill that gap of, you know, we we're talking about how parents are much more their child's friend. I don't really like that term. No. Even when I said it, I was like, that's not I what know. I mean. I mean, when it, giving an enjoyable experience yeah. to the parent to engage with the child in that connected space where parents and children share time together instead of sitting there with some beeping, flashing, annoying, plastic, whatever instead. But to answer your last question, noodle.shop, N-U-D-E-L. Noodle shop. So I'll put all these links onto the show notes so that it's very easy and clear for anybody who's listening to click on it and go to your shop and really start noodle-fying their play experiences. It's been fascinating, Marcus, and I hope that our listeners really get to listen and experience all these things that we're so clearly so passionate about. And I'd really love to see that change in the world. And I think I've been watching your videos and including that little... um, I think it's just a short version, right? The Wheels of Wonder documentary. Mm. It's really an eye opener and I would really recommend, and I'll put links to all these things in the show notes for listeners to just go and have a look because I think we need to get a little bit more curious and see what else is out there. And I just think that this contraption is the answer to everything, really. It's it's to get (laughs) kids playing. And I really, really appreciate you coming on to Blue and Curious and sharing this with our listeners. And I wish you guys and your company and your charity every success. I I hope this is something that just will blossom because it's ultimately for the benefit of our children. And that's what it really is all about. It's not for us, it's for our children and their growth and their development. And it does the best for them. And that's amazing. And we can't ask for more than that. So thank you so much for sharing. It's very kind. Thank you very much. It's great to be here.